You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Michael Gross. How are you, brother? Very well, thank you. It's a pleasure being in there. Trust me. I've been likewise, like, likewise. Your videos this week. Yeah, some... This is surreal. <laughs> Honestly. You only messaged me today. I know. Yeah. It's just the strangest thing, isn't mm. it? I think I've always believed in good karma. I mm -hmm. think if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. Exactly. And if it, if it doesn't work, it don't work. And mm. so you came back really quick. <laughs> I wasn't even expecting it. I saw like it was just yeah. lounging around in the front room, right? Yeah. Then I saw this message. All right, brother. I was like, he's, he's answered back. Yeah, it's just, I think sometimes you just got to go with the flow of it, isn't it? Yeah. So my, literally, my friend mentioned it to me last night. He went, you should dip in. You've been watching it. I've been watching it. I said, yeah, I've been watching it, you know. I've been seeing Yami and started to get to know a few of them now, like, you know. Um, and then he goes, you should tell me. I thought, well, let's try it out. So yeah, that's, that's yeah, real. Yeah, three hours later. Yeah. But your story, your mum was shot by the police. You yeah. started the Brixton riots in 1985. You've battled with addictions. In and out of prison. Now you're trying to do good in life. You're actually trying to help police brutality, not for the police getting brutalised I've actually well. switched, switched the game over. Yeah. And I just felt that, you know, what people don't realise is that I went, there was two sides to my story, right? The first side is that you got the shooting of my mum, right? And they made it look like a black, this young black guy running around Brixton or London with his gun. And he's just a maniac, right? But I had really, I was quite diverse in me as a person from quite young. I've always been that way. I've never been, I've never been in a gang as such, as such. I've been in a crew, I've been in a firm, but never been in a gang. And it was really strange when my mum got shot. It was my pals from Lambeth Walk that pulled me through. And they were all Londoners, Millwall supporters, footballers, Costa mongers, pub goers, bookies, you know, that kind of attitude, that kind of lifestyle, that, that underbelly of the underground, but the nicer part of it rather than the, the really horrible part. And so, yeah, they really helped me a lot. And I've never, I've never forgotten them because they just keep you on your feet. No matter how well known I became, they'd call me all sorts, they'd just treat me, <laughs> they'd treat me so normal, it was ridiculous. And yeah. I just did love being in their company because I knew that if I was doing something wrong, and which they did do, if, even when, when I was on the cocaine, I was on it bad. I mean, I lost myself on it. And then they'd come up to me and go, cowboy, you should like, you should sort yourself out, you know? And I'd be like, fuck off, you can He's, you're drinking it, yeah. What they call you, cowboy? That's my nickname, yeah. Because they had guns or what? It, well, <laughs> what it started off was, it started off because I went to Tim with House, which is, which is, there was little gangs. There were, you had the younger ones, the older ones, and I, and I was in that little middle, and everybody had a nickname. We had Matty, Pear, Dodger, Slab, Beaver, Dim Shit. We had everybody there. Beaver, I like that one. You like Beaver? <laughs> you like Dim Shit was a classic. Um, slab Ed. Everyone had a name. And I was playing football in the playground and someone seen me go up the fence and they said, we've got to give him a name. So he was like, look at him, he's Bandy. Why don't we call him Cal, no, call him John Wayne. And someone went, fucking John, you can't call him John Wayne. That just sounds stupid. And then someone said, why don't we just call him Cowboy? And it stuck. It never, I never got, I couldn't never get rid of it. If I could leave Vauxhall, come back two years later. All right, Cowboy. I'll go away, come back again to another bird, go back to Vauxhall. All right, Cowboy. Mm -hmm. To the point that when my mum actually got shot, my pals were saying, get cowboy, tell him a geezer in Brixton got shot. So my pal went, you silly, silly cunt, that is cowboy. They went, no, it's not. The geezer's called Mickey Gross. So they went, that is cowboy. He goes, what, cowboy's not his real, <laughs> his real name. And we all look at him and go, how can, you, how can someone be born with a name cowboy? But that's how everyone knew me. So yeah, and then the, the shooting just escalated it yeah. more. It's like it just stuck. Yeah. We'll go through everything, brother. I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Well, I'm, I'm a, the oldest of seven kids. I mean, mum was a single mother. Um, we was moving around South London from when I was... We lived in Lewisham, then we went to Brixton when I was about four. And we lived just off the line, Routon Road. Um, and it was tough. 
for everybody, it's not just me, it was just tough for everybody. And so I, my mum, God bless her soul, I would do anything, even at that young age, to try and help her. She's my mum. And so I was very quickly introduced to crime by the local boys. I was a bit of a tea leaf anyway. I'd nick anything, sweets, bikes, scrap bikes. I'd go on flipping scrap yards and do what I got to do and bring back metals and all. I don't know. I just 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 do what I had to do. And then but the boys in Brixton sort of like um, took me under their wing. And that was it. I was just like this little mascot for these bigger boys in Brixton being thrown through the window and rubbish like that. And I became unruly beyond my mother's reach when I was seven. So they tricked me a little bit, took me to court. I know they did something, but I didn't know what. And then my social worker came for me one day and said, yeah, we're going to take you for a drive. Took me to this place in Heathfield called Beechwood House. And... Um, they told me to go and play. When I went and played, she do they drove off. Came back, my suitcase was in the, is in the yard. I bawled. I cried my eyes out. I just, I couldn't, I, I, they couldn't console me. I was just that bits. And then I stayed. I, I, after a while, I kept running away. And then I finally settled down when I was about 11. So the first three years there, I was like Kunta Kinte. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was kept coming on running. And then um, I... <clears throat> settled down for a couple of years, really got into my education and started to learn to read and write. Came back to London when I was about 14. I was still coming for holidays to my mum, going back to the children's home in, in school terms and maybe come home. So then I finally left children's home when I was about 15. I didn't even survive in London for six months. I was banned. Banned me from London. Why? I got caught doing burglaries on bail. Wasn't a good look. So <clears throat> I went to the magistrate court and the judge just said, we're gonna, we're gonna remind you in custody first. So I did a couple of months at um, Stanford, Stanford, Stanford Hill, Stanford, yeah, Stanford Hill, down in um, Hammersmith. And then he, I <clears throat> went to Reading in the men's hostel at 15. So I stayed there for three years. Then they banned me from Reading. Um, <clears throat> but while I was in Reading, I actually did two sentences. I did a DC in my summer holiday. Then in, came, came back to school in the summer holiday. They gave me a ball store at Easter. So in between my school and I did these two prison sentences, Boston and YC, DC. And then from then, that I, funny thing is you mentioned football, right? So there's a book out, come out now called Portland Ballstorm. And it's written by a guy called Pat, Pat Figgs. Figsy, he was in the, the gym orderly there. And we had an, our football team was notorious. We actually got to the final, the Dorset Cup. So we beat Weymouth, the semi-professional team. Massive, great. It's the biggest football pitch in the country. It's built in the quarry. And we used to play on it. And um, it was that moment where, you know, when you're on 15, 18, and I've done from 16 to 18 in, in Portland and, and, and Lewis Prison. And uh, I was in that... That edge, where was I going with my life as a kid? It was just still, you know, tasting what porridge with bird is all about, right? And it's, I was doing so well at my football that Reading came for me when I was in Portland Ballstall, signed me up for a trial. I was proper happy. I thought, this is it. We was all talking, my, my boys were talking to me in the landing, you wait till you make it, man. I want to be your agent and blah, blah, blah. Screws was coming into my cell. They gave me their shin pads. Another one came in. It was just a, a, a crazy, crazy moment for me. Came out, went straight to my probation officer because I was still under 18. Told her I got my trial. She goes, you're banned from Reading. I was like, what? I smashed up the office. Don't know what happened there. Just completely lost my temper. And then um, I just sort of like had a chip in my shoulder and just thought, all right, I'm just going to just fuck everybody. I'm just going to just get in trouble again. Um, got another sentence within six months again. I was shit at it, but too brave. I'm not sort of shit. I was just too bloody brave for my own good and quite desperate. So I was doing a lot of grafting. <clears throat> my pal is me and my pal. I won't mention his name. He, does, he says, you're not a crook until you've been nicked seven times. And at first I didn't get it. He goes, why would you get nicked seven times to be called a villain? He goes, that's, that's when you know if you're, you are a villain, you, if you're going to go for it. Because when you get nicked once, you might you go, oh, I'm not going to do it no more. Get nicked twice, you can, okay, I should have learned the first time. Get nicked three times, you think, it's either I've got to pull my finger out or accept this is part of the game, right? So 
I was like, so what? You're, I've got to be nicked seven times if I'm called proper thief. He goes, yeah, Mickey. Oh, you're not a proper thief, mate. And he was at it. Him and his sister, I, love, I loved her, her sister. She was, I used to move with her. Oh, she was proper grafter. She could graft all day. She'd get up in the morning, wouldn't come home until she's made it, if that makes, if that makes sense. And, and then she'll start off with creeping, then it's, then, <laughs> then it's dipping, yeah. then it's shoplifting. Yeah. We still ain't making money as well. <laughs> it's back to creeping. <laughs> and then on the way home, it's, let's do a burglary. <laughs> Until we get something, we're not coming home with no money. Does she have a target in her head how much to make that day? She's going to make her money. Yeah. She's coming home with right. something, right? And that's it. And then we're going to sell it. So I said, love game room with her. And then, um, yeah. And then finally, we got split up. And I was uh, reading, then come back to London. And then... Um, yeah, I sort of like got little bits of trouble in there and then I went back inside and then I came out. I went to a place called North Fire. So it was in between my, I was 20 and 21. And I was in between that bit, was it YC or prison? But they just dumbed me and said, you're going to a prison, end up at North Fire. It was really weird. I don't know if they've ever told you, but sometimes in prison you get given nicknames, right? So I've woken up one morning and when it was, I was giving the visit. So I said to my cellmate, can you cut hair? Worst question you can ask your mm. cellmate. Can you cut hair? He goes, of course I can cut hair. I goes, right, listen, I've got a visit this afternoon, man. I, I need to look really good for my missus, you know what I mean? So he goes, oh, I'll do your hair. And as he's cutting it, I just felt, <laughs> I didn't, he didn't say nothing. I just felt, I just felt the wind on my ear. <laughs> where it was a bit patchy. A draft. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was like, is it all right? He goes, no man, seriously, man, seriously, no man. He goes, let me just show you what it looks like at the back. And he went Vroom! at the side of my head and it was bald. And I was like, brother, you might as well just take it off. I was so fuming, but the visit was coming. So he goes, what about your beard? I goes, oh, no, just leave me beard, you know? Just take the whole lot off, man. So they took the whole lot off, right? And as I come out of the room, the, my billets are going to visit. Someone shouts out, all right, Hagler? My favorite boxer of all time. To be called Hagler, I was like, what? I'm old, I'm, I'm going to own that one. Went to the, I was, it was quite well built anyway, but I just maintained that build and football and everything that goes with it had been a prison jock. I don't know if anyone that means like the prison football and the jock. So yeah, that was the first time I got given a proper prison. prison yeah, yeah. So you've been in prison since you were seven? Homes. I've been in an institution since I was seven. And what was the mindset? How was the head? Was it, were you just decided to be a bad boy just to be a criminal? I don't, I don't know. I'm not a criminal. I've never told people that. I'm a grafter. There's a mm -hmm. big difference. What I is would, the difference? I'll make money in any way it comes to me. If I have to go and work, I work. If I have to go and do a robbery, I'll do a robbery. If I have to go and nick a car, I'll nick it. I don't have a skill set. You know, I had a sentence and they, they tried to A-cap me and B-cap me and they couldn't do it. You know why? Because I, I, I don't have a a set crime. It's literally, if I get nicked for that, I won't get nicked for it a second time. That makes sense. How many charges have you got? I've got 75. <laughs> I don't know what category that comes under. Is that you got 75 charges? See my CRV. Shit. Eight, nine pages. That's going to be a long podcast if I read, <laughs> if I, if I, if I read all this. It'll be very rare. The only common, common charge I've got there is assault against police. That's the only common charge I've got. You'd be very rare to find me doing two more than two moves. Have you cleared off all your fines? <laughs> no, I just do the bird. 140 quid fine in the 80s, man's quite steep as it's well. Steep, steep. I got a fine recently, about seven months ago, maybe a bit longer. I was running one of my projects and there's this, there's this activist around my area and um, he, he picks on everybody. All the councillors, those that can't really fight. He's really one of those new age activists that wants to put it on you came into my building and bought 40 people and just raided it. Just shut down my building, man. Why? He just, he was just being awkward. And I looked at him and I said, we're going to call the police because it's a proper building. I, I'm in the insurance. I just can't fight and all things like that. I'm trying to give you a warning, but you're not having it, mate. So please come. And I know the rules. So I know, all I need is a report number. I can get him out. Right. So I've got my report number. And he's like, yeah, well, I ain't going nowhere. So I went, you know what you are? You're a cunt. As soon as I said to him, you're just a cunt, mate. And I walked off. Do you know you walked to a police station and reported me for threatening behaviour? Took me to court. <laughs> for using the word cunt. I couldn't believe it. 
So they took me to court, found me guilty at the magistrate. I didn't say a word, just said you're guilty, £10 fine. So he's like grinning at me. So I said, yeah, I'm going to show you how the system works now. I'm appealing. So I appealed. They said, guilty again, £15 fine. I said, no, man, it's not good enough. I'm going to, I'm going to appeal again. So I appealed again and I got it to the Crown Court. And they said, uh, yeah, the judge gave me first four years. Uh, four, I had four hours, but when I got there, one hour. And um, they got me in the dock and it just it was a shambles. So when I got in the dock, the judge said, have you got anything to say? I goes, yeah, I do, Your Honour. Turn it around to the geezer goes, you're a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> and the judge goes, you can't do that. I goes, no, no, honestly, he's a cunt. Give me ten pound fine and let me go. Someone goes. <laughs> someone goes. You must have been the right kind for you. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. So it's yeah. It's fair. So I won't go down that route again. What going on as a cunt? But so um, when you were twenty one, then was that the year your mum was shot in eighty five? My mum was shot. I was twenty one. Yeah. So what happened that night? This, the, did you have a warrant out for your arrest? Was so my pal and mine had a warrant for his arrest. Is that for firearms and he, he got burglary? done for a robbery. We all went to a place called Hertfordshire together. It's four or five of us. Sometimes we just go out for a drive, look for some birds in different areas. And my, my Anthony goes, yeah, I know some birds. He took us down there. He was giving us a walk around and there's my house and there's my tree. And well, where's the birds? Where's the birds at? And there's oh, no, no, but there's that. So we went home, we left him there. He found the bird in the end, so he said, but he got done for robbery. So he gave all our names as his witness. So, you know, I happened to have some issues at the time and I had a gun in my house. Um, the issue got squashed, so the gun was going back. But um, the, the day of that happening, me and my girlfriend had an argument, right? And so I was um, showing off technically and she put it on me, really. And I, I didn't know what to do. I was just sort of like, thought, fuck me, I'll just put the big out on. And she's just stuck it on me. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to kill the woman because she's a good woman. I don't know what else to do. I just fired it into the wardrobe. And then, <laughs> as you do. As you do. <laughs> Boss, look what you made me do. The usual excuses. And then the door went like that. And I was like, what? That was quick by my neighbours. That was very quick. So, She's looked round, she's picked up the bullets. I thought, I ain't putting my gun down now. There's no fucking way I'm going to put my gun down because she's picked up the little bag. So I went to the door, thinking it's my neighbour, and I didn't even recognise this fella. Just, it's just some strange man looking at me, going, are you Michael Gross? And the moment he said it, I thought, I'm not going to answer him. I'm not going to declare who I am. I'm just going to close the door on him. So I went to close the door on him, and he just stuck his foot in, pushed the door open, because, are oh, you fucking Michael Gross? And I thought... There must be another one there as well. I, 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 but I'm not going to give you my gun. That was, an, that was not going to happen. I'm not going to surrender. I need to get away. I just stuck it in his mouth, put him on the floor and told him to fuck off. So I rest quietly as I could. I just went, fuck off, Cosa. I whispered it and I kind of left him up, pushed him out the door and he just run. So I don't know where the other one was. So I escaped. But what I did was, because I did, um, I did, is it, I did an MTC when I was a little boy, army training, cadets. And they teach you about war, war combat, a combat zone. And the, a, an officer, a, a soldier is declared, if he puts his gun down, you can't shoot him. That's, that's some weird rule in combat zone, right? So it's like, if, we have a, if I pulled the gun at the police officer, which I did, if I'd left the building with it, then I'm armed and dangerous. Then they're going to kill me, right? I knew I can't leave the building with that gun. So I wiped it and put it down. So when I went on the run, I presume they found it. I had no idea that the gun got moved and they couldn't find it. So it was, it was only after two days when they got my missus and dragged her in and said, Watson, we need, some, listen, we need to find him because he's dead. We've got the warrants, got this bullet and they sent a message to me. There's a bullet in my name on it. They was Ted ripping up all my mates' houses, trying to find me. <clears throat> and then she was like, they said, yeah, because he's got his gun. And she, that's when she's clocked it. She goes, he ain't got his gun. They goes, no, he's definitely left the gun. We can't find it. She goes, no, no. And she went to the kitchen and she pulled it out. So why would you not take the gun then? Because I would have been armed and dangerous. But you were already fucked anyway if you pulled it out the no, cop or something. No, no, no. If you leave the gun, you're no longer armed and dangerous. So what you must, would you still get done with the same charges though? No. Would you not? No. 
It's not the same. See, I didn't. I it's not. It's a point that. of law. Yeah. So what is that then? So if you pulled the gun out in the copper in the flat, but left the gun in the flat. I've left the flat in the gun. Yeah. Left it in the flat because mm -hmm. I said it in the inquiry. They said he wasn't wanted because the gun was left in the flat. Because I'd be thinking, fuck it, man. I'm just taking the gun. Get rid that's of it. Get, 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 <laughs> get rid of it. And yeah, then, yeah. But you can't do it. Then it's just his word against mine. No, that's too late. You've left the building with that gun, and they can't find but it. But how would they know if it was a gun? How did they know? It was a gun because it would have been your word. Like, that's the way I would have been thinking. Well, yes, but I didn't want to. Uh, what I try to explain to someone, uh, my intention wasn't to go on the run and, 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 and then go in hiding and then go in bushes. And no, my intention was to hand myself in, but not there, not at that moment. Because I had no court, I had no defense. I've got caught with a gun in my hand with the police. Brother, I need to escape. I've not confirmed who I am yet. Does that make sense? So yeah. far as they're concerned, they don't know if it was me or not. So I'm leaving it. I'm leaving it. To, that doesn't heighten the chase. And I've not confessed it's me yet. But what happened was I went to my pal, one of my pals. I said, listen, brother, I think I'm in, I'm in trouble. He was like, I'll tell you what we do. Let's go to, um, we've got, and let's take you to the courtroom. We've got my mate's rough fingers up. I'm going to bring you to the court case. They'll never search for you there. And then, we get you a barrister. That was the plan. Got there. The barrister was so long to come to me, I just lost patience because all these police kept coming in. And I was like, they're going to get me in a minute. I know they are. So I thought, let me just quickly go across the road. I went with my, two of my pals. Let's go across the road. Think, make a phone call to my house and then, you know, for, take it from there. It's filled with police. We just walked in. We walked, literally, I walked in to the far side where the, I was shitting myself. But I need to find out. So I walked right to the far side. I even nodded. All right, all right officer. And there's like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, and Matt, he's, he's then looking at me going, fucking hell, what's going on? But anyway, so that was the thing. And so that, that went on for three days. And then, yeah, they finally told me that they've got the gun and I can hand myself in next day. So I just thought, here you go. It's all sweet. I'll take the, I'll take the rap for the possession of the firearm. And that's the least I can do. And I'll just go down for that, maybe three, four years. I'll be happy with that. Not on the original when you knock my door for an armed robbery with a gun in my hand. No, that wasn't, that wasn't going to work for me. But what I didn't expect, so yeah, they said they stood down, so everybody relaxed. But I didn't expect Lovelock to come and get me. I didn't, I didn't think he was, I thought he would have stood down, but evidently he's, he, he, he didn't want to wait, so... And it was, and I was telling someone that I didn't. I when I found out next, I found that next day I was at someone's house. I, I literally was behaving like my last night on the street. You know, I'm now I'm going to court. I got me puff sorted out. I got me money sorted out. I got a bird come around to see me to sort of like empty me bag for me so I can go on with a smile on my face. I couldn't get to me, and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm away for a couple of years, but um, when I woke up in the morning and someone knocked me where I was hiding and said, because it was my sister, half-sister of the police didn't know about, said, oh, do you know, where's Rose? Is she gone? I said, yeah, why? I said, oh, well, because they've shot her mum. I was like, I literally, I can't explain it to people, that this feeling that came over me was almost like anger, shame, horror, vengeance, and bile. It was like a furball. It was like, it was really, it just tensed me. And then all I was interested in is how my mum was, really, after that. It was, it was a weird, it's almost like a James, did you watch James Cagney? Mm. I love James Cagney. Yeah, it's one of those cool. James Cagney moments. Yeah. Is that what do you hear, what do you say? <laughs> eh? What do you hear, what do you say? He was here. Yeah, what did he, yeah, yeah. Angels with dirty faces. Angel, I love that film. Yeah. And so he, there, was a, he, he, there was a bit when, when um, his mum got shot by the police as well, right? And... Um, they had to tell him in prison and he did this like, and he smashed up the, the flipping screws and he's battering everybody and one comes near him. And I thought, that kid is nuts. And that's, that's before we go any further. Literally, that's what I did when the policeman put his foot in the door. I went, what would James Cagney do to myself? It, that's how quick it happened. What would James Cagney do? And before I knew about it, it was in his mouth. If that makes sense. It was really weird. Uh, a couple of years later, I had to go to a psychiatrist, therapist, because I was pressure. I was under so much pressure. You know, he told me, you've got to get rid of James Cagney. 
You've got him on your Facebook. You've got him all over the place. You've got to get rid of him because he's like this thing in you. Character. And, yeah, and you're, you're following it. And you're following him all the way, you know. Is that to take you away from your own self, though, being another character? Because you're battling being truly you. If you know what I mean, that character takes you away. Like the mask, some people take drink or drugs. You've created a character to yeah. then take you away from whatever shit you're dealing with. Well, well what happened was, man, my mum, single mother, I've got a poem called um, Six Rules. Okay. It's the six rules my mum gave me as a little boy. As she said, uh, first of all, you keep your head of game if you can't do time. So it goes on about, she, you know, keep your eyes on the ground, your ears peeled, your manners, and all these other things, right? She was the one that showed me James Cagney. She used to sit, she sat me down on TV and goes, I want you to watch this man and see how he does to his mother. That's what she said to me. And I sat there and watched this film, saw this gangster, you know, going around battering people, loved his mum to bits, mate. He couldn't say nothing about his mum to him. He's gonna, and she was staunch as well, you know? She was right beside, she loved him for what he was, not, not what she wanted him to be. And I just used to love that about, you know, that character. Yeah. And she showed me everything. She, she um, put Muhammad Ali on in front of me, said, I want you to watch this man fight. Put your hands up in front of the TV and listen to the commentator. Yeah. So when I was at school, in primary school, when I went to children's home, the only black kid in my children's home, I had 16 fights. I still remember to this day. Oh, it's a fight like Ali. And it, you know, mm -hmm. lighting my feet, mm -hmm. giving it all that, and fighting mm -hmm. like that with these little, these little like racist boys down in the countryside that constantly wanted to fight me. But um, yeah, she showed me him. Were you bullied a lot at the being the only black kid in the wilds and the children's homes? Was people trying to test you a lot, mate? I suffered, especially time. in the seventies. Especially, can you imagine the worst thing that could happen to me was watching Kunta Kinti Roots on a Sunday and then going to school on the Monday. And you're the only black kid there. It was tough. But- How was your relationship with your mum when you were in and out of prison? I, 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 didn't, I don't even know what it was the relationship. It was, it was one of those things where she wasn't really a visitor. She was still doing what she was doing. She had other kids. And you know, basically she just sat me down and said, listen, I'm not asking you to commit crime. I'm not asking you to do that. I can't stop you, she said. But if you do it, you need to know that you need to, you're going to do this on your own. It's your, your responsibility to do your bird, not us to visit you all over the place. If you want us to do that, she said, you better put some money aside. So um, that was it. I just knew if I go in prison, I've got to go and do this on my thingy. But I think my children's home gave me that resolve to sort of like manage that. And I was always good at not raising my head too high but not keeping it too low, that makes sense. And choosing my fights at the right time. I think you have to grow up fast. You got to, you got to be clever. You got yeah. no, you can't just fight, constantly fight someone. I've never understood someone doing that. Constantly fighting. You need to pick the right fight that stops you fighting. That makes sense. Yeah, it's calculated. Of course it is, isn't it? It's, not, it's mm. no point in me having a fight with him. It, all I'm going to do is stoke the fire that I'm a bully. But if it's the big boy, if it's a big one, and he's going around picking on people, and you think, well, I'm going to go in there, and if I lose, I lose, but at least mm. I'm going in there. Yeah. That's the thing about bullies as well. As soon as you step up to the plate with them, because they've got so many fucking enemies anyway, yeah. people's automatically got your back. Automatic, that's, brother. That's the way I'd be thinking, chess move, okay, he's the biggest and the baddest. He's trying to put it on people. I'm going to step forward with him, and what happens is, then not only, like, a lot of my friends from back in the day, best friends, we were enemies at the start. Yeah. And because we stood forward with each other. Yeah. After the, the everything settled down, we became best friends. Yeah. Because nobody wants that constant look over your shoulder. So you build that alliance with the people who... And I think that's really important because it's like, you know yourself that there's a lot of bullying goes in these institutions. A lot of violence goes in there. And so I don't want to be top dog. I don't, that's never been my... I just want to do my bird and go home, really. But also, I'm not going to be picked on. So it's not... It, I always have a certain type of people around me that don't look for trouble, but not... But not does it make don't sense? Don't back down. But don't back yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we don't care if we lose, but don't back down, because if you back down, that just creates all the other things, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So just keep your head down. So I've always been good in that way of making sure... Children's home would say, there was abuse going on and everything in there. And then until you're old enough to defend yourself, you've got to go in bundles. 
And it's got to be, you need someone in that group brave enough to say, I'm going in first. You're not coming in after. Yeah. <laughs> You're coming in afterwards. And you'd like, you just need the starter, don't you? The starter. Was that with the screws? Or the abuse, the violence, everything? They was, again, um, the screw, I, I only had two fights. In the, in, I, was it the short, sharp? Well, one screw beat me up. What is that? The short, sharp? It's like a treatment you used to give. It was like regimented. Yeah, short, sharp. A shock. Short, sharp shock. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's almost like um, when I went to Portland and I went, no, is it Lewis? He literally bat he took me out the cell and battered me just because I wouldn't go in exercise yard. Me giving it the large and I was like, I ain't going to exercise yard. I was like, I'm on remand. He was like, yeah. He went to everyone, banged up, come and got me, took me to the toilets and said, right, gross. Boom, before I could even move. He flipping caught me, pucker. Boom, like that. And I was like, ooh, and I went down like that. And he grabbed me by my shirt and he just threw me across the to in toilet. Piss everywhere. I'm on, I was embarrassed. I'm on the floor and he went, now you fucking get that sorted out, you cunt. And I was sitting there and I'm like, this is tough, man. What am I going to do? And then he, I heard him come back. I thought, I don't care. I just jumped up and steamed into him. He bat They battered me. But the point was, I steamed into him, the bell went, and when the bell went, all the other screws came, and when they found out I was being taken out my saw in lockdown, he got in trouble. So that taught me a big lesson. I thought, yeah, next time you try and do something illegal on me, mate, I'm gonna make the loudest noise I can, mm -hmm. because it will bring the light on them, right? So, but listen, I need, I, I'm one of them people that, especially when I went to prison, I like everything to be black and white. That's what you can do, that's what you can't do. I don't like middle grounds. And I think that's a very dangerous ground to be in. So if I go Portland Ballstall, for example, it's a tough Ballstall. I loved it, it was in my element because it's regimented, it's got structure and it tests your ability, you as a person, right? Um, and you're, you are on your own there. It's, it's so far to people to visit you. You really got to make your way in that place in Portland rather than, oh, I've got a couple of visits coming. That ain't gonna happen, man. You really got to knuckle down and put your graft together and, you know, and get it going on. But I was always very lucky. And then what happened was, before I could actually face all that madness between my 18th and 20th and 21 birthday, my mum got shot. So once the, I went back in prison any time after that, I just got a different treatment. I got me on cell, Governors were giving me phone calls. I knew everybody in the prison, or they all knew me. So the screws just say, you've got loads of cousins you have. Do you want a single cell? I go, please governor, please give me a single cell. Because everyone wants to, everyone wants to, who I knew around that area, we all wanted to be, you know, within each other, but I like single cells, so. What was it like then, when you had the, for the, the knife, the, for the gun? So when you had the coppers looking for you for the gun, and then your mum gets shot. What was going through your mind then? I wanted revenge. Straight away? I, I was going to, yeah. What was the copper's name who shot your mum? Douglas Lovelock. Did you know him prior? No. I've heard of him. So what uh, was the full story? What was it, the reason to come in and shoot your mum? Can you understand but why they came into your house with guns if you put one out in a closet? Of course I do. I've never denied it. This is why I'm saying... I think you'll understand this later on when we go into it, but I clearly understand why they went into my mum in that way. And then when people bring me that argument, I have to explain it properly to them. I don't want them having this loose, you know, this negative bias without having the full facts. So I'm saying, yeah, what they did to mum's out of order. No, no, but what I did to them was out of order. You can't, you can't put a gun in a policeman's mouth and expect them to come to you with kids' gloves on. It's just not done. So I was expecting something, um, but that's why I said I put the gun down because it narrowed it narrowed down nods of me getting shot. You, you know what I'm dealing with. Now I'm just yeah. on the run. Shoot on sight then or not? Yeah. So, but now I've got the gun. If I had the gun, I definitely would have got it quicker. But um, I felt, yeah, like I'm saying, it was it was revenge I wanted, and I was sort of like, yeah, I'm gonna, you know, wait till Mum dies. Everyone says she's only got five years to live, but. Um, it, it, it just it, it was eating me up. I just I was I was looking I was looking to blame everybody else for other things, my own short fallings, whether it's my life, whether surroundings around me, even my mum's shooting. You're so desperate, 
to not have the blame put on you, even though the blame's on you, right? Everyone's going, yeah, it's your fault, your fault, your fault, your fault, your fault. It can be a very diff dis dis destabilizing situation. But for me, it was me mum, innit? So I didn't care. I was willing to take the flak, you know? So that was that was one of the burdens I wanted to call for. And the, the, yeah, there was sometimes I just felt it difficult looking at her. When did you get to see your mum after she got shot? Two days later. Even though you were on the run? I got, so they, I went on the run for two whole days, three days, then they shot her on the Saturday morning. I handed myself in on a Sunday and then I went to court on a Monday. So what you see today, the lockdown, I was the, that's what they gave me. I was the first one to get it, but they called it house arrest. Same rules. I couldn't only come out for an hour. I can only, I can only drive around the area. I can only go to the shops to get essential things. Why did they give you bail? Because my mum got shot. So that try and balance it out a bit? They tried to balance it. I didn't even want bail. I said, I don't want bail. I don't want to deal with you. I don't want nothing from you. Is that Just, because you didn't want to see your mum either? Because you were ashamed? I, I, no, because I was still playing the game. That makes sense. Yeah. I was, I just automatically went into that mode of, that mode. I've been doing it for so long. I just, you know, it almost, not secondary, I have to survive that moment, isn't it? But at that particular time, I actually really didn't care. I just thought, I needed to get in. I need to see me mum. I tried to get to the house before that, but I couldn't get to it. It was all surrounded by police. Armed response. Yeah. See if you had the gun on you and armed response came through your door and started firing shots, would you have fired back? I would have fired. So you could have potentially killed a couple of cops. Yeah, I think, I think, I think. No, but saying that, I didn't fire the first time. So I don't know if I would fire. That makes sense. It's, it's not my nature to take a life. I've always told this to people. I think that's why I get in trouble because I don't do that ultimate move to get away. I, 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 I don't think you're lying to worth it. That makes sense. What was it like seeing your mum then being shot? It was horrible. All these tubes coming out of her. It fucking is horrible, mate. And then the worst thing about it is that people are still questioning me. And she just looked at me. She goes, did you do it? I said, no. I'm, I'm that honest with my mum. If I'd done it, I would have said, I'd done it. I won't, I won't let you take pain from me and then lie to you on top of it. I'll let you know, no, I did it. I'm really sorry. But she said, you sure you didn't do it? I said, mum, I didn't do it. She goes, that, that would do for me. And she just stuck mummy ever since. That was it. Everyone was like, you need to hate him. She just wouldn't do it. Why would they want her to hate you? Because it was my fault. So, was it my fault? It's not, it is and it isn't. It, but I took responsibility in the end, but at that time I found it very difficult. Yeah, it all plays a part. So the copper who ran in and fired a shot, what was his excuse? What was the, was your mum running towards him or anything? Was your mum being violent? He said he thought he saw movement. Do you think that you were there to be killed? If, if they no, I was going to be killed. You? The bullet was rubbed down, you know, friend. Mm -hmm. So the bullet was made to give maximum impact on me. They had the warrant signed. It was signed by Heard and Thatcher. So he was there to kill. Maybe the other ones in Brixton that stood down might not be there for kill, but he was a specialist. That was his job. How so many people came through the door? There was 40. And one fired? Did yeah. they not see his hand slipped? Nope. He fired, pointed at everybody and asked questions. What was he, excuse me, he, he wasn't fired or anything. He, wasn't, he never lost his job. He went to court though. He was found not guilty. Yeah. Not was, guilty of, for what though? What well, they it, stitched uh, us up, didn't they? they? What they did was they charged him with GBH with uh, unlawfully wounding with intent. That's an impossible charge to prove. That means they're saying that he left the police station to shoot my mum. No, you never. He left the police station to kill me. So there shouldn't have been no intent on my mother's charge at all. That was the trick. And that was when I started to say, okay, these people are clever. Was it the, the other 40 coppers there the day, were they a witness for the man who shot your mum? Um, or give statements like- No one saw nothing in the reality. It happened that quick. They didn't know she was shot. It's only when my mum said, I've been here. Then the other officer said, what are you talking about? If they thought you fired a warning shot. So that's the, that's the confusion of it all. So it's like- But you're not allowed to fire warning shots. You can do what you want. If it's your house and the surrounding, what they should have done was really did the megaphone bit, but they didn't want that. So it was it was a sniper shit, wasn't it? And it's, they didn't even they didn't even. Some people said they kicked the door. My mum said she didn't hear the door, so that means they jimmied it. Snuck in. They snuck in. So, um, 
it's, it's, re it's, it's, it's really hard for me to talk about it this way because the, the years have passed and I've, I've mellowed, yeah. right? But at that time, I was angry. But what made it difficult for me to stay angry is that my mum didn't actually show no anger. It was really weird. She was like, listen, these things happen, you know. Yeah, my mum, we need to hate the police, you know. No, nah, man, not all police are bad. She was, that was, that was, her, that was her. So, I, if she's not angry, it, it just made me look stupid staying angry, even though I was angry. So, um, I think I sort of like resolved myself to just look after her and do my, be my bit and the rehabilitation side. I still found that difficult to do for her because she's your mother. But, um, yeah, that went off about 10 years. So your mum's, she was on the wheelchair? Paralysed from the chest downwards, mm -hmm. yeah. And how was that for you, trying to battle, looking for revenge? And your mum's sitting there calm, peacefully accepting it? Well, I don't know if she's peacefully. I'm just saying that as a mother, that we didn't see that side. Was she doing that for your sake, though? Because she didn't want to I think she Italian. might probably do it for my sake. Because I think if she said to me, I hate the police, I would have gone on one. Killed a couple of cops. I was just think? gone on it. I just would have, honestly, a, a lot of people was very scared for me and I was scared for myself. I mean, I just didn't make no, I was, I made no, I made a conscious effort to not have no one close to me again. And I've been like that ever since. Once cool. you get close to me, I don't even want you near me again. Very cold then. We come <laughs> towards that, you don't want to feel, your heart must have been ripped right oh, out I'm then. not having you take no responsibility for me whatsoever. Yeah. And it took me to a point now, it's like, yeah, it, it, I've come to a point now that I won't even move from the scene of the crime if you said I'm calling the police. I won't budge. I will not move, I won't do nothing, I won't go on the run, I won't do none of those things. And if I even hint there's a you're going to call the police, I'll call them for you, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm not leaving no scene of the crime, that's what the effect of it was. But it was it was very difficult, and then you got a lot of people trying to feed that anger into us as well. The politics of it all, the racism, the racism, and so it was it was a very. But you you live in the bubble, right? It's, I'm not, I wasn't politically aware. I'm not socially aware at times. I'm still a naive black man in the sense in my in that skin, not so much naive as a person because I was very lucky with my education. I was well. In the children's home when I took it up they gave me a really good education and I think that that was a quite a useful thing for me later on in life that I could fall back on that education to make a go of something you know, a lot of time people don't get that opportunity so like I'm saying it went on for a couple of years I lost my first two daughters you know because of the depression and the anger and management I had with them domestic violence got worse I was just a mess so um I left them two when I was three and four. Then after two years, I had my boy, called Miles, and then she, the mother wanted a, a, a boy to go with him, a brother or sister. So I had two with her. Then I left him, them two, when I was four. And then I had another one. And then he, she had another one. Then I left them, it's like all of them I left at four. Every one of my kids, I've left them at four. Why do you think that is? Just, it, I think it's just some psychological shit in me. Just scared to go past that, to become vulnerable and... Knowing that they can, well, I was. I don't know. It's a weird one. That I, I wasn't in a good place. Me as a person. Mm -hmm. How, right? What kind of drugs were you taking then? Cocaine, heroin, weed. I'd lost it. Completely lost it. I came on one day. This is what really done it. I came on one day, and someone come in my house, turned the gas on, and took the fucking buttons off. It's, it's only I. Do you not know save me? It saved me because I had a budget meter. <laughs> it ran out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for the budget, <laughs> for the budget meter, because it ran out. And as I came into the house, I could smell something. And Hannah, hand, hand went, let me, and as soon as she went to touch the light, I went, no. And she was like, what, what, what? I go, fuck's sake, don't turn nothing on. And then we opened all the doors, out, everything. And when we finally turned on, no buttons on the cooker, none. And that's when she said, it's just getting too dangerous for the kids. Who was that? It? Where was it? Who was that? We have that? no idea. Do you think you're being in police? We don't, we've not. Someone said to me, Do you think it was police maker? I said, I don't know, brother. But how, that how was long a weird that? one. Yeah, that is a weird one. How can you come in somewhere? No one thinks it was stolen that we could find. Just they took the buttons off my cooker. Were you proper active then, though? I've always, yeah, I was always active. So, 
how did the Brixton riot start in 85? Okay, so... How were you at the forefront of that? How long after the shooting as well from your mum, the, the, Jerry? The, sh the shooting happened in the morning and the riots probably kicked off about five. Remember, I'm not... So straight away, that yeah, day? That day. I wasn't involved in that bit because I'm still on the run. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, I, I, I'm, it's all sketchy for me. I'm still in this little box over here. I don't know what's going on. I've, I've no, I actually think not many people know my mum's been shot. That makes sense. I have no idea the impact of what's happened. I'm just still sulking in my own mad world of self-pity and, you know, looking, you know. And then at one point, I'd started to just live with it. But yeah, the riot started by, by and, I, and I know the girl did it. She just took the brick and f threw it at the, at the window. Feisty little girl she is as well. I love that woman. I, I, I can't even say her name. But she used to visit my mum a lot. She's one of my mum's friends so it's like a lot of my mum's friends went to the police station like, all line people and people from Brixton proper big ghetto people and they weren't having it they weren't having it at all and like a blood clot and police and start dash up the thing and then boom it just kicked off and then of course that was the chance to everyone you know for us that's an opportunity to sort of like loot the flipping place isn't it you know, you know a bit of bit of social commentary and a bit of and a bit of skullduggery at the same time. We get best of both worlds. But, um, yeah, it was... What do you think of the riots then in 85? Every, buildings getting burnt. I think over 200 coppers injured. I... They actually made me go on TV and ask them to stop. Is that why you get beer as well? Do you think? I would really been given... Yeah, they said... If they was, they felt that if I was reminded in custody... They'd have caused more riot. shit. Yeah, yeah. Ain't that funny though? Hey, eh? Nobody gets bill. Nobody you know I mean? gets spelled. Uh -huh. I was like, I, I didn't even want it. That's uh -huh. the thing about it. I was but like, could I they understand bell. as well? Look, you've got to look at. I try and look at everything from every side. That like, no man should be getting popping off shots straight away without anything to do that. Like you don't just get in a house, sneak through the door, and start popping off shots. No. So to shoot an innocent woman, and if they've come in to kill you, do you know what? It is understandable, especially if you've put a fucking gun in a copper's mouth. But because they've shot your mum, then. Did the coppers understand why the riot started as well? Yeah, of course they do. But the thing about it is that we're not all judged by the same thing, are we? Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I got two years for coming out of my house. I walked out of my house, right? Police drove past, pulled me over, found a jiggler in my pocket with a pair of black gloves. Two years. Do you know the judge, how the judge found me guilty? He said, if you think he was thinking about a crime for just one second, find the man guilty. So we're like, what? Everyone thinks of a crime sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the worst summing up in the world, isn't it? I'm like, I'm, 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 like, I'm gone. I am finished. Finish me off, mate. Um, with Lovelock, they did it their way round. So we're saying, but he's a skilled, trained. I'm not even trained. It's just off the hip training, isn't it? Bottle. You hope you can get it off tomorrow. I want. I want. I won't be the fastest gun in the in the in the in the area, will I? Could be someone else. Or pulls out the knife quicker me or get that punch in. So, you know, it was just, he, I, I, like I'm saying, he did what he was trained to do. That makes sense. And then, and if you put all the, um, all the, all the bits together, it is, you can see it. Why? But at that time, it was a political game for the body. So they, they use it that way. But, um, like have I'm you saying, ever came face to face was, is it Lovelock never what's his name him. Lovelock never met him never would you yes I will how do you now yep. what, what would happen if you met him 10 years ago I'll, I'm going to hold my hand out to him you yeah. know, because on the mental health issue I think that is he still alive yeah he's I'm going an to old man I'm going to try and set that up if you could I'd you love and him. because I think no, I, if, so if I'm going to come forward in my life I, I did um, my name is Earl have you seen that programme yeah I did my own version, right? This is my record. You know how much restorative justice I've got to do to clean my slate. Mm -hmm. So I literally went round one by one doing all these different things, free, whether it's probation I worked with, then I worked with people in care. So all the ones I've been battling with, I've had to go back to them and say, what can I do to bring something positive to someone in that children's home or someone in that DC or someone in that ball stool who is going through those little nuances of things, the bullying or the racism or the other things that the screws can't hit on. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, so with him now, what I felt with Lovelock is, is that 
now I'm, I've done everything. I thought, you know what? There's only one bit left for me in my reality. I know my mum still feels it. She does feel it for him. I know she does. She, she, that's her nature. It must have been tough on him as well, she said. You know, she must have been a good woman. She's a great woman. She's honest. That's mm. what I like about her. She doesn't look at something. What was your mum's background? Where was she from? She's from Jamaica. Yeah. Look at that, bro. Look at this. Yeah. See that flag? I'm gonna, you can keep that, James. Mm -hmm. Thank you, brother. See that flag? Mm -hmm. That's the maroon flag. Not the Jamaican flag. The maroon flag. And the Maroons are the only free people in Jamaica. We've got our own land. So this is a play? It's, it's called a, a spiritual a, woman. It's called, it's called a complimented, complimented play. And mm -hmm. normally it's done for performance poetry. Uh -huh. So that's my, I wrote that. This is me performing. Uh -huh. So I performed, I wrote spiritual woman based on the mm -hmm. woman that she. So when the riots started kicking off, how long did the riots last for? Three days. Was there anything good come from it? Because nobody the Brixton mob are like, they don't fuck about, man. I, I know a few boys from Brixton and they are solid. They would look for any excuse to fucking cause a riot. But with this kind of stuff, it's good to make a stand because the brutality, like you say, there's good and cop, good coppers, bad coppers everywhere, like your mum says. But to get in and shoot an innocent woman, it's going to cause uproar, especially if you've been racism in the 70s, 80s, 90s, well, your, your whole I, fucking I, life. It wouldn't have been the right if I got uh -huh. shot. There wouldn't have been the right if I got shot. No chance. This, it was just there probably been street parades. Everybody's house. Everybody's house is safe for tonight. All, we all know your mother. Yeah. In, in, is 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 the matriarch of the soul of everything, isn't uh -huh. it? In, I don't care what culture you go to. Most cultures, the mother is an important element. So I think once they saw that was your mother is getting injured in your own home. Yeah, so they went out there. How many people were rioting? The whole of Brixton was rioting. Yeah. Fucking hundreds was nicked. Mm -hmm. The whole place was burnt down. The buildings was burnt. People was killed. It was a tough one. It was tough. When did they tell you, to, did you tell them to stop on TV? Yeah. They, How they, hard was that for you? Well, it wasn't because I actually thought we had them. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I thought, this is it. You're not We've, thinking then to make a deal saying, look, oh, no, I'll, no, I'll do I, this. Forget me. I thought we had, the policeman cannot get out of this argument. It's impossible. You've shot a woman in her house. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you tell me. I just felt the more riots we was doing, it was taken away from her to chance to defend that, that right she's got that is very rare to get hold of a woman. Mm -hmm. But of course we've discovered, no, we wasn't clever enough. You, you know what I mean? So when I, I would still say to them, um, that you know, calm it down because you know it, it's we were smashing up the built the place of Brixton. Some pieces, some of the buildings that got shot. We know these people as well, so you know there comes a point where. Do you think that defeats the purpose? About it does defeat the purpose because you, you know you just you've gone beyond the purpose to just greed. Yeah, it's and just it's, absolutely causing it. Yeah, yeah. I'm all for people doing street parades and people doing fighting for freedom and justice and everything but when you start portraying doing things through vengeance anger frustration setting things in fires looting then it, you've got to question that also because where's the greater good in that it's yep. great to create noise i believe yep. creating noise can create awareness it can create so many things that like yep. people who they run around and they'll do their thing that like, it's great to get people uniting to create awareness and create change but when you start destroying other things with it then it just raises fucking too many question marks where the when you're going to get the change. Everybody's got goodness in them. Like I hate the fact of race, religion. I hate the fact of borders and everything. That like everything's divided. I believe it's divide and conquer. Yep. Everybody just fighting each other and hating on each other. Yep. And really, we're all human beings. I don't give a fuck the colour of your skin. I don't give a fuck where you're from, what your religion is, what your belief is. As long as you're a good person, that's what morally that's really it, should that's what it comes matter down in life. To, do you right? know what I mean? I think, like, like I was saying, I think we were before, a lot of my actions was based on greed yeah. in the past. So, yeah, I would go to, the, well, some, there's going to be a riot in Brixton. We're going to have a placard. No, I'm going there to go make some money, you know. Yeah. This is, this is like, yeah, that's this is, an opportunity to break any shops, yeah. You know, I told someone, the riots is like, when you're in the visiting room, right, in the visiting room, someone gets caught, mm -hmm. right? Someone gets caught swallowing and the, all the screws swarm in on this one character and as they all swarm in everybody else is like 
Yeah, 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 yeah. And then when it's finished, we're all sitting there like that, right? Like, oh, mate, you're lucky, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and we all look at each other. Oh, mm -hmm. Who went for it first? Because we're all sitting mm -hmm. there like, and that's the rights. I think the same rights. We look for that moment to then go, what? Yeah, man, the police is over there. Yeah. Fight them. Because some of the people that's fighting did. It's, it's almost like when you said gangster, I said, no, I'm, I, I'm a grafter. You've got some great fighters. I'm sure you know in Scotland, there's some great fighters who never done a day's bird in their life. Yeah. But they can have a row. Mm -hmm. But they're not, they're not thieves. They work, right? But they're still standing next to an armed robber. And they probably do that armed robber in a straightener. You, you know what I mean? Even mm -hmm. the armed robber's going. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All the gangsters that I know in Glasgow can't fight shit. Yeah. <laughs> It's just that dangerous. It's just a wait in your bushes and yeah. pop out and put one yeah. in your fucking head. Yeah, it'll pop one yeah, out on you, yeah, you know yeah, what I yeah. mean? But will he actually be staunch? Yeah. Is what I saw when you're doing a, uh, someone doing talk about this the other day. Be staunch. I think I'm staunch. I think I'm pretty staunch. I will stand beside you, James. If it, if you're wearing the right, I don't care if we're going down together. I, will still I won't allow no one to pick on you in front of me. My own conscience won't let me do that. That makes sense. We'll go down together then. At least we both have black eyes. We'll, <laughs> we'll be looking at each other. Yeah. Well, at least he knows. Mm -hmm. At least he knows if he comes after us again, we'll get him this time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We're like, we'll just ambush him. He's not as strong as we thought mm -hmm. he was, yeah? But So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a funny old thing. But, um, um, yeah, uh, some of the people that was writing were fighters and had quite good intellect. So they was taking up the cause. You know, yeah, the police, the, yeah. come on everybody, mm -hmm. and then throw a brick. Then we're like, yeah, come on everybody. And then you see a couple slip off, right, with their little trolley. Yeah. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> uh, I'll be back yeah. in a minute, yeah. But, yeah. Um, but bro, yeah. growing up from a, a rough estate, like, you're always looking to cut corners. Where I was from, like my mum and dad used to rig the electricity and they used to do their shit. My dad used to do shoplifting, stealing blocks of cheese, like, if there was a riot in the street, they'd be thinking the same, right, we can go and fucking tan that because the police will be over right. there. So even though people are doing it for the right reasons, there's still always an agenda how you can make money from yeah. it. We, 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 that's, the only thing, that's the only thing we've got, isn't it? Yeah. And it's not like, that's what I'm saying to you, Jay. The people that I'm with, I hate that word, not gangster, I'm not saying it's a mm -hmm. bad or negative word, because there are gangsters out there. Yeah, a gangster is just a, it's just a weak man controlling other weak men. It's not a gangster's a weak person. It's yeah. not a saying. I'm a money maker. Yeah. I like making money. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I don't see, sometimes if I had to put a gun in my hands, like I'm saying, when we go back to the, the, shoot, the, the police officer, I my intention is not to kill him. I don't want to kill him. That's not my name. What nature. the fuck was going through your head though at that moment to put the gun in his mouth? Were you high? No. I was, I was high the week before. I was, I you on a come down? I, I was on a come down. I, 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 yeah, that's I, the worst time. I was on sulfate, <laughs> yeah. sulfate, and the M1 trait, uh -huh. and I've been smoking weed. I wasn't really into drugs. So that paranoid much. as fuck. I was a little bit paranoid. What what I didn't, yeah, you know, I tell you when the paranoid come in. Before that happened, they'd been searching my house for two or three days. And I didn't even know. I had no idea they was in my house until I went to the off license and they told me, you know, the police have been gaining their house every time you leave. I was like. I've been blaming my daughter for moving my headset, thinking it's been her. Leave daddy's headset. She goes, daddy, I don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what I'm talking about, but it was been them. And oh, I don't know, it's just. So once all the riots and that finished, how long was the court case for Lovelock? A year. They did it in January when it was cold. They knew there wouldn't be no riots. Six, January the 6th, I think he got it done, just before my birthday. Not, were the police not worried that, that he never got charged? After that, when he got a not guilty, what was he got a not guilty, not proven? What did he get? He got a not guilty. So a not guilty, but they're not worried that more. Like, who was the man in America get fucking beaten with the king? Um, you, the recent it? one. Yeah, no, the the man, not him. Um, oh, the, king. Yeah, yeah the boy yeah. when they, they were all around the the cars and they, they, they think they don't know if they beat the man to death, but they all get away. The police officers all get away with it, well, they, and I think there was riots. Well, was they, it Rod they, Rod they Rod planned the, the riots to happen. At, they planned the trial to happen at a certain time, and they mm -hmm. realised they have to do it in the in the winter time. So they did it in January. It snowed on the floor, and I think you know. I think again, um, the people um, that moment of weakness for the police they was in control of that of that situation so there was no chance there was going to be a riot really and then 
it's not like I don't think we've got the same type of racism as they do in America. I think it's slightly different, even though we've got it over here. It's not quite the same. Well, basically, the cops and police, American police, they walk with guns, don't they? So, yeah. how bad is it? How bad was it then at that time in Scotland? We don't really see that much racism. It does go on, but it's not as as brutal as it like America, London. It's, it happens everywhere. For me, it's still happening more than. It, I've ever seen it. You see it quite frequently. You see it on social media. You see it on. I don't know if people because they've got more phones now, but you see it quite frequently now. How? What was it like then? Seventies, eighties, nineties for yourself. Going As through a black that, person. yeah. In but, Brixton, how was the police? How did they treat you? Well, it was horrible. I call it the occupation. I mean, yeah, you, 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 it was, it was bad. But again, you see, you see, I'm not going to perpetuate. I'm going to start again. Hmm. The um, the battle was you have to remember what they're 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 trying to um, it's the line we're talking about in Brixton, it's a no zone go area, right? So you know <clears throat> we're not we're com no way complacent or compliant whatsoever, so we're very aggressive towards the police. But there's also a lot of fighting within ourselves going on, right? Because a very violent time. Not if it wasn't police, it was amongst ourselves, and there was that wall of silence. So. What you had was, just like most 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 things, it was the first generation of black people that come to England, right, was experiencing racism differently than in those the black people that was suffering racism in the eighties. Two different ball games. So in the seventies, it was no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. The Irish was thrown in there as well. Even the Scottish was thrown yeah. in there as well, right? Bastards. Bastards. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Yeah. We was all thrown into that one pot. And I think the Irish and the Scottish and the Jamaicans and the Caribbeans, we all got on really well with each other. Yes, we, I don't think I ever had an argument with Scottish, someone Scottish or Irish because we, we seem to get on much later. The racism from the British, though, the police, they was... I don't, I'm not sure if I can put that down to honest, honest, honest racism because they was wicked to their own kind. Have you seen what they do to their own kind? They're wicked, mate. So if they're going to do that to their own kind, what, what chance have I got when I get nicked or someone Irish gets nicked or someone Scottish gets nicked? They, they don't even want us to be doing these type of things. So they, for me, it's almost about the game is, this is the game. This is what, this is what the money project will come together. This is the game and this is what happens when you get involved. End of. We all get beaten. We all get the truncheon. We all get the flipping handcuffs. We all get it for the same reason. Go and back chat him, see what happens to you. Go and throw and pull a gun on him, see what happens to you. Go and kick that screw, that cosmo in his head, see what happens to you. Not go and kick that cosmo in his head and then you expect him to go, okay, Michael, quietly, just come with me, just come with me round the corner while we try and so that ain't gonna, that's not the society we really want, right? So, do you think you it's know, easy then to throw race into it? Just you just to, can throw it in there. Just to put fuel in the fire? Yeah, you can just throw it in any time you want. But racism can be overcome, what you might call racism, I call it ignorance sometimes, or a lack of information, right? Some people are just fed, I mean, history is told by the victors, right? So they're not gonna tell my history in the 70s in schools, we're going to just hear about the British victories and what the British done, and the British bulldog spirit and the British comedy and the British actors. That's how we grow. So you've got this sense of pride amongst the British in, in school. But they would call themselves names. They, they might call me a, a nigger or a wog. But if my mates, the jockney, if it's, a, if it's, if it's my north, that's something else. They, there's so much levels of... Um, com a tribalism is what I like to call it, going on, it, it's, it's ridiculous. So you could have some two people, which I have got, a couple of friends will pucker together. Two support West Ham, two support Millwall, two support Chelsea. They all go their different ways on match day, right? And they all come back match day. They hate each other. They Chelsea this and West Ham that. They call each other names, but they're best pals. My mates used to come around with me. I didn't take black people amongst them. I couldn't take black people amongst my pals in South London. They, they just would struggle with them, if that makes sense. They didn't, they didn't have the, the um, what I would call the sense of humour to laugh at yourself. Because that's the key, isn't it? You've got to be able to laugh at yourself. If you can't laugh at yourself, I find you a dangerous person. Because you're going to be very sensitive to everything. Right? I'm not going to be able to say nothing to you. I've got to be able to take a joke, give a joke, be the butt of the joke. 
that's what it's all about. That's what for me brings that camaraderie. So, you know, I went when I went to Portland, they said you're not going to survive in Portland. They don't like blacks. That's what they told me. They, they stopped the bus, got out their bats, the screws, walked up to down the coach and said, We don't like blacks and we don't like Londoners and gross. You're a black Londoner. And I'm sitting at the back of the coach thinking, I'm in trouble. I mean, I'm, I don't even know what's going to happen to me now. I'm going to do this. But guess what? My football got me out of my cell. And that same set of screws that was saying, you gross, you this, you that, was treating me with a different mentality now because they had the love of sports, right? And they love a man that tries because I'm one of them ones on the football pitch. I would run every inch of the blade of grass. That's how I love it. I don't know, you, how long do you play? Yeah, still play. Okay, so do you run every inch of the blade of the grass? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Except the last, the, the last 30 minutes. <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying, yeah. though? I think a football pitch is a great analogy for pitch mm -hmm. battles of life. Yeah. I can tell your character by watching you play yeah. football. I really can. Yeah. I really can. I can look at you for, oh, my God. Yeah. He's going to get one up the arse of me. He's going to disappear in a game. You know, I look at him like that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I think it's very easy to stick in racism into mm -hmm. a place. And it's then, as you say there, tribalism, it's important. Everybody wants to feel part of something. No matter if it's a protest, I just want to feel part of something. Supporting a football team. I think I read something, feed them bread and wine and people forget what the real purpose is in life. Like, yeah. People just want to feel part of something. That's all you want, don't what you? is it? Going to a football match and shouting and shouting and shouting, getting anger, coming back, shouting, shouting, shouting. Break it all down, what the fuck is it really? Yeah, but you know what told me, someone told me once, I mean, oh, them racist football supporters that's going to them games. I said, let me tell you something about those racist football supporters. When I've got to play a game up in North, <laughs> and it's like, you know, drizzly and cold and miserable, and you've got these tough Northerners tackling you, and you've got this side of all these other Northern hard men that want to fight you, that hardcore crew, they're on your back. We love them, because they're going to raise the voice, they're going to raise my spirit, and they're going to be there in the trenches with me. That's what I love about Millwall supporters. They're great. They don't care the size of the audience. They're going to support their team and go all the way with it. So that tribalism is very important. But to call it racism, because you're not part of that tribe, Oh, I'm not part of it, so you must be a racist. It goes beyond that. It's it's not about that. It's a, it's about something else for me. How long did Love Lock's trial gone for? A week. Is that it? And what what happened when they got you not guilty? Were you in prison at the time? Or were I you was out? out. Were you I was out? sitting at my mum's. Was your mum at court? Did she go to she the court? She went to court, yeah. Every evidence. day? Was there any One day she so went. Your mum never got any compensation or nothing? She got compensation. Did she? Hmm. She got, uh, she got compensation. I was... Because they, the conversation they gave her, they said she had five years to live. But um, she survived longer. So I used to say to her, do you want us to go and get you some more money? She goes, no. Mum, you survived more than five years. I mean, I care. Well, I, ain't, I, don't, I ain't begging them nothing. So I used to admire her for that. But I think that that was one, one of the things I, I thought we should have, the, the system should have looked at and said, if you said you've got five years to live and you survive more, then the rollover rolls over. For another five years. For another five years. Not, you've got five years, they survived 10 years, you're going to do no more to that. No, no, that's just wrong. So, um, um, what was your life like? Were you still getting in trouble after that or did you try and screw the nut? No, I was still in trouble. Were you? Did I that not make you realise, fuck this man, I've, you kind of blamed yourself for that and there's a lot of other shit happening. I, I believed in my own hype. You know what I mean? The, the Brixton, Enhance your name then, where you thought you were something special? I, I, I was, I, well, you know already how these things work, James. If you make up the headlines of the press for your court case, that's it, isn't it? And there's certain, certain things that give you certain, you know, authority and command of that sense, right? So, you know, I'm not saying, it was a well-known argument and the argument of, people hearing that I put the gun in the mouth, kind of like made it folklore, but it was it was still a silly move, that makes sense. It was, a, it was a move that was not really thought out properly. Like I said to you, just, I was there and I just thought, what would James Cagney do? But, um, yes. So what did you do? Were you still getting in and out of prison then after that? I was, because um, I couldn't get a job, mate. I, was, I couldn't get no work. I couldn't get nothing. I was just left with crime. I didn't do it at first. I slowed down a little bit. 
But then, after like 15 years of not working for no one and not having a job, you know, and find it difficult, I just got used to the lifestyle. I didn't know. I didn't know nothing, no different. You know, so there was one or two times I tried to pull out. I just didn't have the arsehole, really. And then uh, uh, I think when I got cocaine and I was that that really ripped me up completely. I thought I, I wanted to die. I tried to commit suicide twice. What so, did you try and do? Well, it always happened after I've had a session on the pipe. So I'm like, <laughs> come, come <laughs> so, down. Were you smoking the coke? I was smoking the coke. Yeah, yeah that's next level. Then, and that fucks with me. Well, I, I mean, was so. serving, you know, for a couple of years. So it's not like because I, I can say I wasn't. Are you washing it with ammonia? Ammonia and bicarb. <laughs> Fucks with your banana, that. It's a fuck banana, up. Fucks I didn't your... touch it. I wouldn't touch it. And then one day I was out somewhere and someone gave me a spliff at a little the bugle. And then someone went, you're wasting it. Because what? This is a Charlie spliff, mate. This is like the most beautiful, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. you got to try it on that. And they gave me the pipe. And I'll never forget. I kept telling them, I hit that pipe, mate. I've never come down since. I was chasing that dragon for fucking years trying to get that first high. How much do you think you spent on it? My mum said, you, she doesn't know how much I spent. They think I spent a lot of money on it. All those tons, all the bad stuff that you've done, all those years in prison for just creating an addiction then, isn't it? Well, because yeah, I, was into, I, went from, I went from there, because like I was saying, I, I went, f I mean, after my mum got shot, there was, um, there was, there was, um, I got crime watch, there's my crime watch court case, which I won. What happened? Allegedly, they said I robbed a bank, right? Um, <clears throat> but I, I won the, it was on Crime Watch and my name was brought up and I had to go to trial and blah, blah, blah. And um, they tried to measure my face and all things like that. But we won that court case. And I think that made me, gave me a full sense of, a full sense. Importance. It just gave me a full sense that I could continue doing what I was doing. And which is what I did. And then of course I got into the pipe and I just, my my trade started to change from going from these other bits of work and I went into fraud. Then it's thing now I'm shoplifting. Now I'm shoplifting, I'm shoplifting tins and rubbish. You're homeless. I'm, home, I'm homeless, I'm sleeping on the sleeping on the floor. I've, I even slept in St. Thomas's Hospital. But, uh, yeah, but all that time I had an anchoring of being a poet. It was always with me. So it, it was almost like I had this hidden dream in me, but I just didn't think I was going to ever get it. It was just a nice dream. You know what I mean? And so <clears throat> I think I, I reached the point, I collapsed, my health went all over the place, my mental state was gone. I was finished. What weight were you? Six stone, seven stone? I went up to about eight stone. I, went yeah. I, was, I was always big, quite muscular. I, my trousers were just falling off me. My teeth was fucking horrible. My, my skin was grey. My hair was brittle. I was a mess. Everyone just thought I was a write-off. And I thought it was deserving. I thought I deserved to be there, to be honest with you. I didn't think I deserved any better. I, I thought I was very lucky to stay alive for how long I was. And then gradually I sort of got a little bit better. I mean, and then I was realising that I needed to do something for my mum, really. And that's what that's, that's what was it for me, the turning point. To just watch her do what she did and bring up the kids and... Do you think you slipped, spiraled down that because a senior mum as well? Is that your escape from blaming yourself to just fucking smoke yourself into an oblivion and just hide from the pain? I was still waiting for my mother to die. Mm -hmm. I'd really got rid of everything close to me. So I had nothing left to hold on to apart from my own personal revenge, if that makes sense. So it's, it was a vendetta against yeah, yourself. Yeah, it's, it is against me. It's against me because I'm I'm literally wasting my ability of what I am capable of doing. And the only one who believed in me was my mum. She said, he is talented and just needs to get it out. So What age were you then when you started making the changes? 36. Yeah. And it was because... And what was that moment? What was that day? What was that... You have that, like when I was going through my change at 30, I had mines at 30, I don't fuck this. When I used to sit and get mad with it, when I was bang on it, I used to look around and think, look at the fucking state of these people. 
But yeah, I was fucking the worst because I was always the first in and last to leave. I <laughs> owed everybody fucking money, but yeah. because I was a funny bastard, people just fed me, kept feeding yeah. me drugs because I was yeah. always fucking. You're like me. Last. I was quite a nice yeah. person to be. But I used around. to look around and I used to think, look at the fucking state of these people. Even though I was a mess, I used Jay, to think I was always going. I to used get to clean out. people's houses when I'm on the pipe. <laughs> Because I'd be sitting there going, brother, your house is terrible. And I'd be yeah. hoovering and doing washing up. Mm -hmm. They're like, just get on the pipe, Mikey. I said, no, nah, mm -hmm. man, I, can't, I just can't sit here mm -hmm. with this rubbish. And, I'd be, and, it, and literally, I, I devised, this is what made the, the game change, man. I, just, I started to do like some counselling, come bravado chat with man on, the, on it. And there was more than that, to, to a point where four or five of us would sit together and not, not just go down that old route of the crackhead. You know, eat some food, mm -hmm. have a conversation, play some music, leave it on the side. Making it sociable. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Is that what was okay? Just find yeah. yourself at yeah. least, and then gradually, <laughs> just gradually it started to pin away. But the turning point was um, Shelly, Shelly um, put it on me about my, she said, I heard you can write. And I goes, yeah, I can. Who's Shelly? The mother of my boy, Jordan. She put it, put, put it on me. And she goes, yeah, well, go on then, write something. And I, I don't know where it came from. I just sat down and I wrote this poem called Charlie Prayer. Pain of cocaine runs through my very vein as a slave to its master. I bear a shackled chains, shackled to my bottle. I have no focus with life. Why should I marry? My Charlie is my wife. Foil, pen, bottle. That's all I need to make me tick. But things, be, but things won't begin to fall in place until the lighter clicks and then I'm on my pipe, my life's motorbike, going down that rocky road. And I took a puff, it wasn't enough, I feel like an ugly toad. What should I do? Where should I go? I need more of this devil's gold. Creeping, weeping, feeling depressed, worn but too would not be told. Silence. If the outside world is loud, it begins to hurt. I need another stone to take away this sunset. What am I really doing? This must sound really sad. Why should I be doing this? You must think I'm really mad. This is becoming serious. No longer should I. Does it feel like a game? This is one beast, my friends, I truly have to tame. I cannot blame the dealers for only a service is what they feel. I can only blame myself for enjoying this deadly thrill. And I know I don't need this. It's all in my mind. I must believe in myself and self-respect I must find. So I'm going to throw away my bottle and put my futures in my hands. And against all adversity, I know I will stand. But the journey that's in front of me will be hard from the start. But I have new ambitions that's going to be running, ruling my heart. For I want to see the world without the Charlie Mist. I want to enjoy the more simple things like my girlfriend giving me a kiss. I would love to hear the laughter of my child enjoying life or walking down the aisle, going to meet my wife, love and care and kindness. That's all I need to make me tick. Things begin to fall in place and everything would just click. But do not give me credit or say that I've been bold because there was more to loving Charlie. I remember being told. Oh man. How done and you remember all that? Yeah. And that was your first ever poem? That's my first poem I wrote. Fair play, man. And I put it on the wall every day and I'd read it every day and, and do one bit of that poem, that line, you know. Just with, to remind yourself. Just to, just to get myself better, you know. And I, I buy my daughter her trainers. You ask the mother and my kids, they say every time he goes out to the shop, he never comes back with nothing for himself. Never. It's always for one of my kids. I'd spend the money on them because I can't go back and get that train off their foot, can I? I can go back this if I sold you the trainer, I wouldn't feel no way to come back to you and say, James, give me that, give me them trainers, mate. I'll get a new pair tomorrow. How many kids have you got? Seven. Seven. And you've lost two mothers to your I've kids? I've lost two mothers, yeah. How did they pass? Cancer. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, so what? Was that more obstacles in your life? Were you clean then when those girls passed? No, I wasn't always clean. Um it I think I didn't get hundred percent clean until maybe because it lives with you, doesn't it? It's one of yeah, those it's things. That, there. It's, 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 I keep telling people, I don't, I'm not one of them people that says, right, don't show me the crack. I'm the, I don't want to see it. Don't mention it. Mm. I think it should be on the menu of life. I think I should yeah. be on my menu. 
I should be able to look at the menu in life and go, all right. <laughs> Start our crack. Man. I'll have a bit of cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> what, what year is that? <laughs> yeah, okay. Is it a good rock? Is it a good rock? Or, you know, I'm, I should, that's where the self-control comes in, right? Yeah. It's when you have to hide it, Bill, bury it and put it somewhere. You're not in control. I need to be in control. So it's there on my list. Cocaine's on it. I just don't have it. It's mm -hmm. as simple as that. You know, there's other things on there I can take. I like, I like my Jaffa cakes. I'll have that instead. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's all there. Um, so, 100% clean, no. Uh, it took a lot bit longer for me to really beat those. And it's not, most of the time, the problem come is other people taking it as well. And then they presume they can take it in front of you and you're going to join in. And half the time I do it, it was my social. But it's a, bur it's a burden on me if I do that because yeah. it takes me to the next level. You know, my nose goes, my fucking attitude goes, my back goes, my paranoia comes back in. It doesn't work for me. So the key is, yeah, just, just keep it on the list. I'm entitled to do it if I want to. And if I do it, don't let it impact no one like it did before. When was um, the last time you were in prison, Michael? 2005. So 16 years ago, mm. it's a long time. I was clear up to 10 years before that. How many years do you think you've done in prison? I don't know. A lot of it's remands and little bits of sentences there. I've never been the one that got a big sentence. Touch red man. I, I think that would have done me as a character, if that makes sense. I think, you know, now and then, <clears throat> You've got, to, you've got to do a bit of bird to I, even up the life as itself. Really. I got away with so much sometimes I just mm. get put down. Fucking, I'm, I'm glad I took the break. Yeah. You know so what I mean? are you doing with your life now then? Because I know you are very anti-authority, hated the police, probably what killed them at one point, to then, because the, the assaults on police have risen over the mm. last few years. Yeah. You're trying to bring that down, how come? Well, I've been doing non-violent communication for years now. It's a tool that I've had to use for myself to help me with my own violence and expression myself, because I didn't know how to do it properly. But once it was, in, it was brought to me, it was something I could share. And then what, what people don't realise is the work I do now, I did that when I was on the landing. It's not like I came out and then did the work. This is what I was doing on the landing. I was writing the prisoners' letters. I was going to the adjudication with them. I was sorting out their visits and stuff like that. I was going through their law books for them and their court cases. So these things of helping someone on the landing was not was not no new to me. In fact, it gave me probably a better edge when I came out dealing with some of these organisations because they're sitting there telling people, oh, we love, they love us in there. And I'd be like, no, we didn't love you. They didn't know I was serving. No, we didn't love you. You had dinner. There was a pudding there. There was a Jamaican meal there. That's what we came for. And after I realised that good, um, good social restorative justice doesn't really exist. You know, and that the real word, the, the real, the, what they was meant to do was bring in these peer mentors or people that people look like them that can speak to them. So, of course, that was my opportunity. Um, and because some of the places I really, I've been served in, some of the officers knew me and knew that I had this non-violent way, because in my last sentence in 2005, um, I was a full-time poet then. I was touring, um... I was in the band, you've heard of Haliban Free, mm -hmm. Sopranos. Yeah. Yeah, I was with them, for, touring with them for two years. Um, and then we often, I was in the band called the Cunts. I was the black cunt. <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah. I, was, I was the black cunt. Fuck's yeah. sake, man. Do you know what the word cunt means? No. Well, got, it means a waste of space. It doesn't mean what people think it means. Mm -hmm. It's just been, somehow got crossed over in culture. I use it all the time. Yeah, I love it. Larry Love goes, we need to own it back, man. It's a great word. Mm-hmm. He goes, people really hate that word. They hate it. <laughs> but they don't understand the, the nuances yeah, of it. All. Scottish use it all the time. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I've got a couple of friends. They they could use they could use probably three words mm -hmm. around the other words with cunt and hold a whole conversation, you know, like like um, yeah. mastermind. Yeah. It's like it's all the different tones yeah, and I the can way use it as a positive <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're a lovely bastard, you're a lovely <laughs> cunt. You know I mean? yeah. But um yeah, so um I've always been, like I'm saying, I've always been, I'm not a violent man, violent man, but I will fight. Mm -hmm. I'm not a gangster, gangster, but I will stick up for myself. Um, so it was, you know, and I was always like that in prison. I was I in the befriend the scream screen. I was a Samaritan. They trained me to be a Samaritan while I was in there. So I was the, uh, the, the bully, the bully rep. 
So these little roles I've always been able to hold because I've had a good education as well. It, it held me in good stead. So then when I came out, it was quite easy just to continue doing it. And yeah. all my projects have got prison numbers, names. So I've got a project called Canteen. I've got one called Unlock. I've got another one called Joint, Joint Enterprise. I've got another one called Going Equipped. They're all like <laughs> spun of the, the actual negative words that we will groan with to turn it around. And so it makes it easier for me to sell it when I go in the prison and say, this project's called Unlock. Like, what the fuck did you, how did you do that? you got to unlock yourself, brother. What do you think looking back at your life, Michael? Uh, I think it's, I think, I think it's been, an, I've been blessed and it's interesting, right? And I, I know they talk about my mum shooting and the riots and everything. But <clears throat> it's, it's, I don't, I can't even put it into words, brother. I really don't know how to say. But what I, I will tell people is that, um, good is good and it'll always be, if it's in you, it will rise. If it's not in you, it just doesn't come up. It's just going to be negative. So I've always believed that there's good in me. And I feel that if I'm given the opportunity to, to shine that, I can do it. And where I am now, I'm comfortable with what I'm doing. That's why it's just what we're talking about now. This new project I'm doing called Pass the Baton. I felt no way to turn around and say to people, listen, this is about, you know, uh, showing respect for someone who's meant to be just doing a job, right? Not only are they doing the job, we're just aggressive, we're spitting at them, we're violent with them. These people have got families, sisters, brothers, they just want to do a job. And if it's, that's the society that we've grown, I don't want to be part of that. I yeah. really don't. I just, you know, and, you know, even Lovelock, uh, he's a human being. Yep, he shot my mum. I was part of that triangle, but he still suffered, didn't he? He must have. Yeah, that's the thing with coppers, man. Like, they get such a rough ride, but. I know a few now obviously doing this show I've interviewed a couple the shit that they go through like the PTSD the struggle a lot of them battling with addictions there you go. You alcohol just the word. there it is there the drugs man like divorce they don't yeah, domestic violence their houses are fucked and the things that they see day in man. day out they see the negatives in life every day they do a lot to protect us the, to roam yeah. the streets and people need to take that into consideration. I was always grew up, fuck the police and this and that, but then you come to a certain age and you think, really? Is that Fucking right? shut up. Who are you yeah. going to call if your daughter goes missing? Do you know missing? what I mean? If your, if your daughter goes, yeah. if your child goes missing, mm -hmm. am I going to call one of the gangsters from Brixton Road? I'm not, it's am just, I? I'm um, going to be on the phone, 999. People I want the... really need to understand the work and everything that they do to we help to protect. some respect There's, and some manners. Yeah, and just understand that they are there to do a good job. Yes, there are pricks. I've dealt with them. I've had a couple of beatings back in the day. There was a guy called Muscles back in the day up where I was from in Porto. Car chase, crashed into him. He kicked the shit out of me, man. I was only like 22. Bastard. But <laughs> then, and yo, and I thought you said that. Bastard. But you're still in your mind, you'll think, dirty bastard. But, and it's in your still in your mind, when you see them, you go, I hate they bastards. But it had the fucking right because I could have killed people. Yeah. I was fucking steaming. And I'll tell you what I learned as well. As by doing all this, there's a thing, I didn't know there's a thing called the Nine Principles. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know the police. There's a book, I think, called the Nine Principles yeah, as the, well. And the, that's the, that's the soft thing one. The police has got its own Nine Principles mm -hmm. and it's, it, it undercurrents everything when it's all about. And if you really read it, the police is just an extension of me, the citizen, you know? So if I'm saying to you lot, it's quite acceptable to go up to that man and scream in his face and spit at him and call him names. I'm telling you, it's all right to do it to me. Really, it always do it to him in that, in that sense. So, but we need to be a bit more human in life. I think we've lost that now. So that's why the, my badge, before my badge I'm putting together for this project is the swash. You know the colour chart? Mm -hmm. So I did a show six years ago called What Can I Do For You? H-U-E, right? Happy Urban Experience. And you're not allowed to come in my show and call yourself black or white. You're not allowed to do it. You have to, you have to, you have to put your hand or get the colour chart and find your colour. I find you more interesting. So everybody, just let you know I'm Jamaican ginger. All right? And um, so we've taken that concept and we've taken it further and now we've just, we've made it into a little badge and it's, we've got the whole colour tone of human colour tone on it. All right? And then we put human lives matter. And I think that makes it easier for me to then go, well, he, he might be a policeman, but he's human and he's a victim. And so if we can't hold out that, that 
that hand of restorative of of hand of 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 of, of, of showing someone some kind of kindness, right? The currency of kindness, then then you know it's we're make I'm making a mockery of my own work if I can't take that big step and put my own my own bias to one side for the bigger good for something which could work in the end if we get the non-violent communication in there if we can get we can get the the de escalation of police officers and I'm not and, and the thing is what I said to the police was when they came to me with it I said listen there's hard end you've got 50% approval rate right it's 50% so the other 50% I'm not going to the hard end 10% the hardcore that's going to take too long I'm going to go at this end the other 40% who's in the middle ground who's not quite sure where they fit do I fit the Black Lives Matter or do I fit with Human Lives Matter? Do I fit with um? Do I fit with this over there, gay, or do I fit an agenda? Where where where? where? I said the vague again, and yeah. So we need that commonality to say, listen, why don't we just say we're human? Don't. Yeah, this is a human thing. Yeah, this just human be right. a fucking good cunt, and that. Yeah. <laughs> be human cunt. How was that then for you to be putting a gun in a copper's mouth to a copper shooting your mum to then? changing in how I look and how the police operate to try and help them, to try and protect them also. I don't, there isn't, there isn't. It's just my, it's just because of the field I'm in now. Just everything changes. So going forward for the future, Michael, what's all these other things that you're doing? So currently I've got my poetry night. Okay. Which is called Doing the Lambeth Walk. Where is this? It's in Lambeth Walk itself. Okay, we will leave the link in the description if you can send me that. Is, yeah, it, is there tickets out and sale? Some bit of stuff. I've got a new book. I've got a book coming out. Okay, what's that called? It's going to be called hand, Here's My Hand, Here's My Heart. Mm -hmm. and it's going to be written some of my pals that was with me during the riot. So you're going to get much more deeper mm -hmm. understanding. And I want them to stand, bring their place in this debate because I think once they're there, it won't, it's no longer a black riot. It's just, it's just an uprising, you know. Um, um, I'm doing a, yeah, the Parrots and Bats coming out and I've got this new piece of work I'm looking at called um, I'm Reviewing My Situation which is Fagin you know, I'm reviewing you know that song yeah yeah. I've, I've done a London version to that uh, so it's going to be I've got to get that going and that's it really I've, 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 I've come to a point where I'm quite I'm, I'm running for council running for council for the Green Party so they've asked me to come back and do that again. I'm an older statesman now. I'm nearly 60, James, mate. You know, I think I'm still a young man. I've, I've yeah. got to accept now that <laughs> I'm a flipping old fella now. You know, just one of the yeah. old codges, but I feel good. Yeah, you but know? you're doing good now, which is the main thing. Try to do good to not make the wrongs right, but we all make mistakes in life. We all fuck up. But if you can push through the darkness and start making changes and start bringing yeah. some positive love and light into the yeah. universe, well, no, no, that's love what it's and all love, about. But it's just being honest yeah. and just telling people, here's some tools, yeah. do that. What about when your mum, how many times did you have that discussion with her? Did you ever sit and break down and say, I'm sorry, and she forgave you? I'd imagine she'd forgiven yeah. you straight away. Uh, but uh, wait, I, have you forgiven yourself? I, well, yeah, of course I've forgiven myself. Yeah. I've forgiven myself because I've done my restorative justice. Yeah. There's nothing to forgive. I've restored. Good man. That makes sense. Yeah. I don't. I don't think I need to forgive myself for my mm. for my predicament. But what I can do is say to you, I've restored some of the damage that I've done, and I'm proud of that. It's whether I'm doing good. It doesn't come into it. I don't even want a pat on the back. To tell you the truth, like you told me, I'll do it for Jaffa cakes. If, mm. if, if I mean, I don't care. I just I feel better doing it. Mm -hmm. and I think that's an important thing and yeah. it's come from here for anybody that's watching that's maybe in the struggle especially battling with addictions you've been there what advice would you give for them Michael? I was in battling for an addiction well like I'm saying you know you've got to let it out it's like you've heard me do the Charlie Prayer right? Mm -hmm. so I love c creative writing I think it's an opportunity to express myself and you know, you could I could write it in any format, but I write it from an inspirational point of view. I like really good leaders. So I just told people that you you if you you will stop when the right time for you is to stop, if that makes sense. But don't wallow in it too long. I think everybody can wallow. I think that was the key that I learned. You can wallow, you can be the self-pity, but there comes a point where you just gotta just dust yourself off and just say, Yeah, I need to get on with it. That's why I told people, I told people about the 12-step program. Have you seen, you know that one? Yeah. I love that program. And, and what I loved about it, you can adapt it to your own. I, I adapted it. I became quite creative with it. I didn't like the way they brought it to me. So I said, 
They, and my course, can I do my own bits, my own poetry to express that just the same way? They said, yeah, so I did this, this whole thing. But and again, it's not so much me. I think there's a lot of people have given me a lot of advice. So like, I tell people, if you really have changed, go and get some help as well. Don't feel so embarrassed. And I think the key to about changing is vulnerability. Once you feel that you're vulnerable and you can feel that embarrassment, that's a good time to change. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't try and change when you're angry or you're, 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 you're clouded or you feel a bit guilty because you've been on a large binge because I've done that many times when I've had enough, man, of my addiction. I'm not going to smoke no more than I smoke. And then I'm at the end of it, oh my God, what have I done? And I perpetuate this circle. So, you know, and, and the key is, you, for me, the, 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 the change came is when I just, I made my own decision. I think that was that's important for you as a person that uh, to have your own autonomy and say, okay, I've done this wrong. What can I learn? Which you heard me say. I don't think I'm. I don't think I should apologise for anything, but I should definitely learn from it. And I think that's the key here. Just tell people they need to learn, and then just find that self in them, that seed in that, and, and surround yourself with the right people. Hey, cool. For coming on today and telling your stories. Yeah, well, I appreciate but, it, mate. Um, can, but, I, can I close with kind of something? Of course gonna, you can. can I, I, this is the part, again, I've always encouraged people to try and write mm -hmm. and get the expression out because sometimes that's what the drug is. The Therapy. Is in. So one of the things we did was, was um, um, uh, when I did my last sentence, it was based on a historical crime, which means I've been straight 10 years, a documentary was coming at me on TV and an ex-girlfriend saw me on TV and pressed charges. And I was like, shit. And when I went away, I was sitting in my cell and I was like, oh, I'm depressed. And I brought this poem it's called Locked in a Pen. So it's all those men that there that's been away understand and might understand what this poem's about. And it goes, locked in the pen, all broken and life's in ruins and what brought me to this end, man springing into action, tucked in, banged up behind the doors, doors shut to the sound of the keys and the locks. On the wrong side of the world, blue jeans and striped shirts. On the wrong side of the world, walking round in circles. It's only one day my boy comes to me, pays me a visit, he said, Dad, don't worry, just like you, I'm into crime. And I thought, what? Father and son on the most wanted list, both serving at their time, tucked in banged up behind the door, door shut to the sound of the keys of the locks on the wrong side of the world, blue jeans and striped shirts on the wrong side of the world, walking round in circles. Here's a question. Can the leopard ever change its spots? Can new tricks be learnt by old dogs? And what example am I? always on the edge and always on the slide like a broken, broken needle scratching over prison records. In again, in again. It's only bars and high walls. One day my freedom will come and on the right side, not on the wrong side. I'll change the words to this song. Tucked in, banged up, behind the doors, doors shut to the sound of the keys of the locks. On the wrong side of the world, blue jeans and striped shirts on the wrong side of the world, walking round in circles. I've always wanted to do that in the James English show, and I've done it. <laughs> Man of many talents, Michael. God bless you, brother, and keep doing the good fight. Check out more of my podcasts on the right, and be sure to like, share, and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.